Welcome, everybody. Today I'm being joined by Matt List, who is a postdoc fellow in Adrian Bird's laboratory at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, Monica. Why don't we start off today by having you describe a little bit about your background, how you ended up in Professor Bird's lab, and how long you've been there? Um, so I joined Adrian's lab in 2009. I'd, uh, I'd done a PhD in biochemistry looking at some uh, chromatin-related proteins. I was already in Edinburgh, so I, I knew what was going on in Adrian's lab, and uh, it was a really good opportunity to be able to join and, <clears throat> and work on some uh, very interesting questions. Okay. Um, Great. So we're talking today because you are the first author of a paper that um, is uh, coming out in Nature Neuroscience. And um, I think most of the viewers that are listening to us today um, uh, know about the fact that MECP2 binds to methylated DNA. And they know that there is a specific area on the protein called the methyl binding domain which is important because that's where the protein attaches to DNA. And if there are mutations that disrupt the ability of the protein to be able to bind, you end up with Rett syndrome. But in this new paper, you've identified another key area, geographic area, so to speak, of the MECP2 protein. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the study was really started by looking at the distribution of mutations that we find in patients. So uh, there are certain kinds of mutations that really lead to MECP2 just not being produced or production of the protein being stopped halfway through. Uh, on the other hand, there are mutations that are really quite subtle changes where there'll just be a, a few atoms along the protein that are different. And we felt they had the potential to tell us a lot about what would be important in the protein. So you already mentioned the methyl binding domain. And we knew that there were lots of, uh, lots of changes in this area that cause Rett syndrome. And that uh, told us that whatever MECP2 does, it's very important that it binds to DNA for it to be able to do that. But by looking at the profile of mutations in MECP2, we could see that there was a, another region of the protein where we found these subtle kinds of mutations as well that also give rise to Rett syndrome. So we uh, set about trying to figure out what that region of the protein was doing because the mutation seemed to say it was very important. Okay. It was, it was quite interesting the way you did it because I think patients have, um, pa families have seen the diagram that shows all of the mutations that happen on the MECP2 gene. And if you look at all of the mutations, they seem to happen everywhere from beginning to end. But... You looked at it kind of with a very different perspective. So I think that the diagrams where you can see mutations everywhere, they often include things called nonsense mutations, which truncate the protein. So if you had a mutation in a part of the protein near the beginning that maybe wasn't a very imp important part of the protein, but was a nonsense mutation, this would still be highlighted on such a diagram. But if you focus on to the missense mutations, the ones which just change a few atoms, then you can really highlight the uh, important regions. The, the other thing that we did was to only consider the, the most stringently verified mutations. So ones where they were not only found in a, in a girl who was diagnosed with Rett syndrome clinically, but also both of her parents had been tested and it was found that the mutation was absent in both of those, both of their parents. So this is really good evidence that that mutation is causative. Right. Whereas sometimes there can be a girl um, who has Rett syndrome or a closely related disorder, but the, the alteration in MECP2 might not be causative. So we, we think we filtered out those instances from our, our starting point. So it's a great example of how uh, mutations that we find in people are really informing the science. Yeah, and as well, having the, the parents who have been tested was a really, um, really important piece of information because I think w w without that, we wouldn't have known what to look at and what not to look at. So, you know, that, that really helped the science get underway in this case. Right. 
So Matt, tell us what you found. What, what is this region and what, what's it doing? Um, so we found that this region interacts with um, something we call a protein complex, which is really just a, a, a collection of proteins tightly associated with each other. So this protein complex is called Encore Smart, um, which is not a very informative name, but there's been a lot of work on this, and people seem it, it would be regarded as a, an enzyme that can alter the way DNA is packaged inside a cell. Uh, so this could tell us something about how MECP2 is working, that it's possibly going to regulate how genes are expressed. Okay. Which w would not be a huge surprise given what, what MECP2 is. Yeah, I, it, it wouldn't be a huge surprise. Um, on the other hand, there have been a lot of studies looking for genes that are misregulated, and yes. people do, do find genes, but the the changes are usually quite subtle. Um, so we never... It could be that the brain is very sensitive to s small changes in gene expression, or it could be that MECP2 does something that we haven't thought of yet other than regulating gene expression, and that's the, the key to understanding this disorder. But uh, at this stage, we still we still don't know that. There's been a lot of um, suggested, you know, hypotheses about what MECP2 is doing. Do, do you have a, a a favorite hypothesis that you'd care to share with us, or is it still too preliminary? Um, I think if I shared one, it will probably be proven to be wrong one day. So I will uh, I'll hedge my bets and say I I, I think that whatever MECP2 does. It does by bringing this complex, this Encore Smart complex, to DNA, uh, but quite what happens downstream of that, we're still we're still not sure. Um, good. Ba based on the literature of what Encore Smart does, the most obvious hypothesis would be that this is switching some genes off. But there is really nice data from other labs showing that in the absence of MECP2. Lots of genes get expressed a little bit more, and lots of genes get expressed a little bit less. So I think it's too early to say anything with a great deal of confidence. Okay. So the data in your paper um, that uh, supports the hypothesis that there are these two key areas, the methyl binding domain and, and the specific area that binds to NCOR, is really quite strong. So one is the patient mutation data that you've just um, described for us. The other one is kind of uh, the mirror image of that. So you looked in databases that contain data on um, polymorphism, so non-disease causing mutations in MECP2 in the normal population. Exactly. And, and you, tell us what you found. So in that case, we see that the uh, that MECP2 in healthy individuals, you do find changes in the in the protein sequence, but these changes are excluded from the methyl binding domain, the DNA binding region, and are also excluded from the region that we've identified as binding to NCOR smart. But all through the rest of the protein, we see these benign polymorphisms. So this this tells us that in, in healthy individuals, you, you can make changes in MECP2, uh, but you can't make changes in these critical regions. Right, so um, changes in areas outside of these two um, important locations don't cause Rett syndrome. Exactly. But if you end up with a mutation in these two areas, you get Rett syndrome, and that's the bottom line. Yes. So yeah. you had a, a, a third um, important piece of data, and that was uh, you created a, a mouse that had um, a mutation in this area of the gene 306. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we had a, a collaboration with Mike Greenberg's lab in Harvard Medical School, and they created a mouse with a, a mutation in the region that binds to NCOR smart. Um, but we'd shown using other methods would abolish the interaction between MECP2 and NCOR smart. But using their mouse model, we were able to show that uh, in vivo in the brain, this mutation has the same effect and uh, leads to disruption of this interaction. And they have also done some work to show that this mouse uh, 
in many ways behaves the same way as the MECP2 knockout mouse, which is the, the most widely studied model of Rett syndrome. Right. So in other words, having a mutation in, in 306, which some, some families who will be listening to this have daughters that have mutations um, in 306, it's a common mutation, is just as severe as not having this protein to begin with, really, is what we're saying. Yeah, it might not be quite as severe, but it's it's almost it's as almost as bad. Okay. I think once you take into account the variation between people with three oh six and people with other mutations, it's um it's very hard to distinguish them on a case by case right. basis. Right. So because so many potential functions had been attributed um to MECP two, there was this thought that perhaps Rett syndrome might be caused by lots of complex, um, you know, uh, reasons. And in fact, this paper suggests that that may not be the case. It may be quite simple. And it may be the fact that MECP2 is acting as a bridge between methylated DNA and NCOR. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? So I, I think one of the most important contributions in this paper is that it is a, a simplification. So there's a, there's a lot of literature implicating MECP2 in lots of different functions, um, showing that it can interact with many different binding partners. And and from that information, it's it's easy to get the impression that it's a very complicated protein, um, that MECP2 does a little bit of this, a little bit of something else, a little bit of that. And to to understand the disorder, we would have to put a lot of information together. But our paper is trying to identify which of the things that MECP2 does really impinge on Rett syndrome. Um, and we think we've found that it's this bridging function, that you have one surface on MECP2 that binds to DNA and another surface that binds to NCOR smart And if you disturb either of those surfaces, you get Rett syndrome. As long as both of those surfaces are intact and MECP2 is present, then the brain can function normally. Okay. So I'm, um, I'm all for simplifying. <laughs> and, um, well, now, what happens downstream of recruiting this complex 2 DNA might turn out to be very complicated. But okay, well, ho hopefully not. Hopefully um, not, yeah. yeah. So, you know, parents that are watching this um, are going to ask themselves, well, it, you know, this sounds great, and we're glad that it may be simpler. Um, than previously thought, but what does it mean in terms of, you know, moving forwards towards treatments or, or a cure? Yeah. yeah so, that's a hard question to maybe answer, um, but, but tell us your thoughts on that. So I, I think there are two schools of thought when it comes to going towards a therapy for Rett syndrome. So one is to say, you know, who cares what MECP2 does? We just want to be able to put it back. And there are lots of researchers who are um, you know, that's their goal. They're working on ways of reintroducing MECP2 and maybe not so interested in exactly what it does. And then the other philosophy would be to say, well, if we study MECP2, figure out how it functions, what it does, why it's important, then maybe from that understanding, we will be able to go and design therapies that don't involve uh, having to put MECP2 back. Because putting MECP2 back is likely to be a, a huge technology challenge. So if we could find a more uh, oblique way of doing that, then I, I think that would be very helpful. So, you know, at this stage, we don't have a therapy out of this paper. It's not immediately obvious what we're going to have to do. But I think the more we understand the problem, um, the more we identify of the components that are really important in the pathology of Rett syndrome, the more chance there is that we'll be able to find something we can do about this disorder. No, I, I agree. And um, I mean, as a funding agency, RSRT, RSRT is also pursuing um, strategies. You know, we're funding the consortium, which is basic science, and we're funding other people that are trying to figure out what MECP2 does. But in the meantime, we're pursuing things like gene therapy and activating the sign on MECP2 and modifier genes, because we don't know which one's going to work out yep. first, um, yeah. or whether we're going to end up needing some kind of combination approach. So, 
to play it safe, you have to try to pursue all the different angles as aggressively as possible. So what are some of the next steps for, for the lab and for you that, you know, that, that come out of this paper? So I think now we have to figure out what aspect of Encore Smart is it that's important. Um, so Encore Smart is a, a huge and very complicated molecular machine. It's it's an order of magnitude bigger than any CP2, and um, you know some things are known about it, but it's still quite a a mysterious entity. And I think the the most logical way to make progress is to try to identify which parts of this machine are really are really important, and hopefully that will throw some light on what's 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 a missing rat syndrome? When was this? Uh, when was Encore cloned? Do, do you know that? How long have we known about it? So it was in the mid nineties, and uh, so it was discovered because it can interact with a, a class of proteins that repress transcription normally but then uh, transcription is activated in response to certain signals such as uh, c certain kinds of hormones uh, would be the most famous example. And how, uh, many, how many labs work on NCOR? Uh, uh, just, you know, ballpark. Is it a dozen? Ballpark. Is it 50? Is it... Yeah, um, I think a lot... Not many labs would work exclusively on it, but a lot of labs have had some interest in it because this complex interacts with lots of different transcription factors. So people can be working on their favorite protein and then they find themselves working on this mm -hmm. complex. Like, like the bird lab. Exactly like we have done, yes. Right. Okay. Well, Matt, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, and, no problem. Um, I want to congratulate you on the paper. I know it was a lot of hard work, um, and um, we hope that you will keep Rett syndrome in mind as you go off on your independent career. Yeah, definitely, and, uh, yeah. Thank you okay, very much. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me on here.